That's interesting. Unlock spell crits with a feat. All right, we're watching this. Tell me about the VTT. Flush with cash, thanks to the incidental Who are you? Stranger Things has provided Wizard Dungeon Games. Masterpiece. The D&D game publisher is finally fulfilling my childhood RPG dreams. As part of the release of One D&D, Wizards of the Coast is launching a fully integrated virtual tabletop. This new experience will feature fully interwoven character building, environment rules engines, and tools for lazy dungeon masters. And just the pre-alpha looks amazing already. But these are my childhood dreams. And children lack the wisdom and foresight to understand how this seemingly small development will likely have negative impacts on the tabletop role-playing community for generations to come. Longtime viewers of my channel will know that communication philosopher Marshall McLuhan is one of my all-time heroes. Penning the maxim, the medium is the message, in his book Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, McLuhan discusses how the mediums we use to express our ideas irrevocably shapes the way we interact with those ideas. Or, in simple terms, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Therefore, in order to cater to the mobile user from birth, younger generation, it only makes sense that Wizards of the Coast would develop a vertically integrated virtual tabletop for Dungeons and & Dragons. And that's even ignoring cultural shifts toward virtual collaboration due to the pandemic. This was inevitable. Teenagers were already highly comfortable with this stuff in 2017. The issue with Watsi's in-house VTT development, however, is that for the past half century, Dungeons & Dragons has been played around a table with friends and family, and largely without the concept of mobile devices or virtual tabletops existing in the D&D zeitgeist at all. Therefore, Wizards of the Coast pivoting from a tabletop first to a virtual first business model okay skirt i gotta stop them there at no point did they say that the virtual tabletop was going to come first damn it am i misunderstanding chat am i misunderstanding somebody Therefore, Wizards of the Coast pivoting from a tabletop first to a virtual first business model and yes they're absolutely going to do that okay all right here's his evidence Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons are also now at the center of an aggressive digital transformation. We have made a multi-hundred million dollar commitment to develop digital games in the near and long term while working with the industry's best gaming partners to activate our brands across platforms. I don't know. I don't think, okay. This to me doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean digital first to a virtual first business model, and yes, they're absolutely going to do that, the one D&D VTT wouldn't be worth the investment to shareholders as a side project, would mean that younger kids who are introduced to D&D for the first time will see these fully integrated virtual game systems running in their browser and will immediately be glued to the video game-like nature of the whole ecosystem. Obviously, I'm aware virtual tabletops have existed in the past. Roll20 has been around since 2012, after all, but never have these platforms had such direct and clear access to players that the one D&D project will enjoy. New players will receive marketing flyers for the new VTT platform in every box set, book, video game, and any other D&D paraphernalia sold. Tailspire just simply can't compete with that. In 10 years, nobody will even know what Tailspire is. With all that said, however, to truly detail how this business realignment will influence the game's culture, imagine how players interacted with D&D from 1974 till today. Players, especially while role-playing in the theater of the mind, had no issue dropping chandeliers on goblins, damming up a river to flood flood out a nearby ogre-infested dungeon, or whatever creative shenanigans players can come up with. And non-theater of the mind gaming is something I've acknowledged as an issue with physical tabletop terrain as well. Miniatures and terrain limit the creativity of players at the table, but virtual tabletops? That just adds another layer of obfuscation. Physical miniatures and terrain can be picked up and manipulated by the players at the table even the parts of the terrain set that the virtual tabletop likely forbids, like walls, doors, trees, or even whole buildings. These impulsive and physical manipulations of the tabletop terrain can invite creative use of player spellcasting, for example. In virtual settings, however, it only follows that players will likely succumb to the even more limited and constraining effects of the software itself. If an interaction with the software isn't easy to conduct, and it isn't an obvious option, players won't 
even think to do it. Moreover, because of the news. Uh, for- ah, this is there is a lot. I'm not. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know, chat. I don't know about this one. He is making. He is really going off, going off the deep end here. I don't know, man. Um, so first of all, he's saying that if you have, so if in case you didn't care, let, let's watch it again. Like, let's listen, listen to it. Pay, 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 pay attention to what he's saying. My interpretation of what he just said is that if you are playing on a physical tabletop, it limits it limits your imagination. That's 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 the message that I'm picking up. I'm going to listen to it again. I want you to listen to it the same. But he's basically saying if you're playing in a physical tabletop where you can see things, it limits your imagination. Because and and he's saying that uh and he's saying that the VTT will harm that further. That's what I heard. The opposite of that is what he's saying. Okay, we're going to listen to it again. Let's listen to it again. Listen terrain closely. Can be, miniatures and terrain limit the creativity of players at the table. But I don't know how else to interpret tops, that. That just adds another layer of obfuscation. Physical miniatures and terrain can be picked up and manipulated by the players at the table. Even the parts of the terrain set that the virtual tabletop likely forbids, like walls, doors, trees, or even whole buildings. These impulsive and physical manipulations of the tabletop terrain can invite creative use of player spellcasting, for example. In virtual settings, however, it only follows that players will likely succumb to the even more limited and constraining effects of the software itself. If an interaction with the software isn't easy to conduct, and it isn't an obvious option, players won't even and think to do it. Moreover, because the new virtual tabletop engine developed by Wizards of the Coast already feels so much like a video game, as demonstrated by the concern hushing statements in the launch video, so that people understood that this wasn't a video game, players will likely bring their video game playing expectations with them. Expectations where environment manipulation just isn't worth the CPU cycles to program <sighs> in. I know people in the argument section are going to counterstate about how Roll20 Owlbear Rodeo or even Tailspire Virtual Tabletops already experience many of these problems. But these VTT systems are not the default method of experiencing D&D today. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say this. Play tons of theater to mine only tables. So here's my thought. All right, let me, let me say my take. I think that when you have a map, when you have art, when you have terrain, when you have features, that allows you that tells you what's there it lays the foundation for creativity good call very good take so if i so everything that's not there can be filled in with your imagination you lo- you use less ram on environment and more on engagement exactly so your brain you're using less brain ram on picturing the environment and instead you're using your brain power on what's going on in the environment, right? Uh, he's saying having an absolute image takes away from the image in your head, right? In, in, in ways, in a way, it does. I agree with that. But I think, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think that frees up some of your brain power so that you can imagine other things, so that you can use that brain power on other things. He's saying having an absolute image takes away from the image in your head. And I'm saying that's not necessarily a bad thing. All right, let's finish. finish. And are designed by smaller development teams with limited budgets for marketing. Furthermore, this new development also sets the standard for any other RPG system on the market that younger players might try. Integrating a D&D game into Roll20, for example, is difficult. It requires lots of setup, experience with the persnickety interface, and doesn't offer integrated DMing tools like a random adventure generator that can be set up with just a few button clicks. Contrast this with what's likely to happen with one D&D's virtual interface. Dungeon Masters will probably load up an entire two-scale 3D battle map of Faerun's Sword Coast with pre-generated random encounters and... Oh, God, could you imagine? I dream of the day we can do that. ...adventures and pre-populated towns. Players who are just 10 years old today are just going to expect this stuff if they're to be convinced to try a different gaming system like Call of Cthulhu, Vampire the Masquerade, or Shadowrun. And that leads us to our next issue. 
It's only a matter of time before the digital sales of D&D content will largely be pulled from one bookshelf's DMs Guild and drive through RPG platforms, so as to be shifted to a one D&D virtual tabletop store. And as much as oh. indie it's only a matter of time before the digital sales of D&D content will largely be pulled from one bookshelf's DMs Guild and drive through RPG platforms, so as to be shifted to a one D&D virtual tabletop store. And as much as indie game developers may dislike this, the jagged pill to swallow here is that drive through RPG does a huge service to the independent game community by simply exposing 5th edition players to these smaller fringe RPGs. And when I say fringe, I'm including heavy hitters like Call of Cthulhu, World of Darkness, and Shadowrun. When over 50% of oh, all- Man, is World of Darkness French? I don't know. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll, let me finish. 20 campaigns are created for 5th edition, and the next largest system, Call of Cthulhu, squeaks by at only 10% of campaigns. I guess it is. I guess it, it is. It really illustrates how much every other RPG rule set struggles for any visibility at all. But when 5th edition content is no longer available on platforms which sell content for these other games, the organic discovery of these smaller franchises will become more and more difficult to carry out. And it's not not just smaller and he is like really going like <laughs> he is taking he is taking like the smallest bit of information and just running with it so first of all i don't think the virtual tabletop is going to kill development across the dm's guild or drive through rpg let's let's start there so what he's saying is that once the vtt comes out no more digital stuff is going to be available on DMs Guild or Drive Through RPG because it's going to be isolated. I think that digital maps are going to be more prevalent in DMs Guild and uh, Drive Through RPG. I think I think this is just going to change what's available on those things. I don't think it's going to get pulled. I don't think I don't think either of those websites or any of those websites that he listed. I don't think they're going to lose anything. His next point, man. There's a lot to. There's a lot to. It's a lot to unpack here. Okay, all right, hold on. Let me so let me process this. So in the so let's assume because this man this man wants to make some assumptions. Let's assume that that Watsy pulls everything off of the DMs Guild and everything off of Drive Through RPG. I honestly think that the other the other uh, tabletops will grow because of that. Let's let's use Drive Through RPG. Let's say that all Dungeons & Dragons content gets pulled from drive through RPG. What do you think is going to happen? Because I feel like once Dungeons & Dragons is gone, people will migrate to other games. So, so chat, I guess I should poll it. Chat, do you believe if D&D &D is pulled from X website, do you believe X website dies? Or do you believe other... TTRPGs grow. I hope I asked that clear. We're saying that, so here's here's the scenario. We're, we're going to use drive through RPG as an example. Wizards of the Coast says our VTT has been released. We are going to be the central marketplace for all Dungeons & Dragons content. We will no longer allow any website to sell our stuff except D&D Beyond. We are going to be the market. Will other, in this scenario, in this very specific scenario chat, do other RPGs thrive now that D&D is gone? Or do all those websites die because D because their primary tabletop has been pulled from it? I honestly believe other tabletops will grow, but it's looking like a majority of you are saying the website dies. All right, that looks like a pretty even split. Um... All right, let's all right, let's finish. Dependent RPGs which will have their discoverability nerfed. Game writers who use What what this guy is saying is that all other TPT RPGs will die along with those websites. At least that's my interpretation of what he's saying. D&D Beyond already exists for digital copies and drive through is fine. But mm, that is true, but drive through drive through offers other D&D stuff, fan-made D&D stuff. We're talking like D&D's gone. I think a more fair pool would be X website dies, nothing changes, or other RPGs are go. Nah, something's got to change, right? Look, all right, let me explain something. Nothing changes is not an option because without D and D, if those websites are thriving, that means other RPGs are growing. 
There's no way that nothing changes and other RPGs won't grow. There's no way that happens. If D&D is removed, other websites will be able to thrive as long as that website's thriving. Otherwise, it's dying. Like, you know, in business, you're either growing or dying. If you're growing, other TTRPGs are growing. That's the, that's my logic. I could be wrong. That's my logic. But I don't think nothing changes as an option. Use the DMs Guild content license agreement to create Faerun, Eberron, or Ravenloft content. Sign a contract between Wizards of the Coast and One Bookshelf, the company that owns DMs Guild, to earn 50% of any published content sales while using Watsi IP, while Wizards of the Coast retains rights to the created content. This might be a fine trade-off for people who are happy to make adventures for one of D&D's campaign settings in exchange for the visibility, but these creators at the very least, are able to maintain some kind of tangible record that can persist over decades. A PDF or printed booklet goes a very long way in the perpetual longevity and discoverability of this licensed content. This is why I, today, can still play my favorite adventure, Janelle Jaquaza's Caverns of Thracia, 43 years after its publication. This kind of experience is the definition of generational gaming. There's very little that persists that long that becomes generational. However, adventures programmed in this virtual first oriented 1D&D system, instead of creating generation and generation, generation, generation enduring written content, will instead be wound up in a non-durable, non-migratable system with microtransactions. You just can't make a PDF or a booklet out of a programmed event tree. One of the biggest hurdles of being... All right. So now... Jeez, man. He, now he's saying that fan-made content dies. No way. That might be the most egregious stretch of all. Am I Mr. Tur I, I like... He's saying stuff that is so out there and alien to me. I have to take a second... I have to take a step back and think, maybe I'm misinterpreting... Because there's no way he really believes this, right? Is that the interpretation you got, chat? Like, is he saying that fan-made content is going to die? Being a dungeon master is the unspoken financial expectation that dungeon masters will pay for basically everything. Dungeon masters buy at least three times as many books, if players buy any books at all, and commonly provide the dice, miniatures, battle mats, terrain, and so on. With that said, the fact that there's only one person in the group with three to five players who makes the majority of the purchases isn't missed on Wizards of the Coast. And yet again, 1D&D's new virtual game space solves this WotC marketing problem too. Mm. I'm not going to I'm not going to comment I'm not going to comment that uh any I'm not going to go too much into that but <sighs> You know what no I'm not going to I'm not If Fortnite is any indicator players love to spend only 99 cents on avatar skins, special weapons, or who knows what else they can get through various microtransactions. And don't think for a second that one D&D would be any different. There will be no shortage of premium avatar poses, equipment loadouts, and even environmental asset packs for dungeon masters. D&D Beyond already has dice skin microtransactions after all. Therefore, between these player microtransactions and dungeon master third-party content being tightly wound up in one D&D's platform, Wizards of the Coast will have created the Apple ecosystem equivalent of Dungeons & Dragons. I'm sure you've heard a few people lament that they would give Android phones a try, but between their iPhone, their iPad, their iWatch, their AirPods, and their MacBook Air, they're as hesitant to do so as they are locked into the Appleverse. Similarly, the younger Dungeons & Dragons community will have even more reservations from abandoning not just a rule system they're comfortable playing, but all their assets purchased via microtransactions. Letting all that stuff go just to play in their imagination at an actual table will be less and less appealing to the more dominant 1D&D's virtual tabletop experience. I hope I'm totally mistaken and that all of this effort somehow fosters more generational gaming innovations, but I just don't see that happening. If you'd like to help me make more content like this, I don't know. We are, <laughs> we are really, um, we are really out there. Do you think the VTT that D and D is making will be free or subscription based service? I think the VTT will be free, but I think it will have microtransactions like he described. 
I think I think it will be like he described at the very end of the video. I think well, hundred percent, you'll buy skins to to bling out your. Um, how do you join the Discord server? I think I think 100% there's going to be microtransactions for DMs to buy content to to for map making and I think there's going to be stuff for players to make their to make their tokens look cool. 100% think that's coming. Um I don't think so that's pretty much the only point of his that I agree with. Everything else was like really a stretch. I don't think I don't think Wizards focus is going to be the VTT. I don't necessarily think it would be a problem if it was. They'll nickel and dime the spit out of you in the VTT. I, I know. I know. It's going to be just like Hero Forge. So we'll be buying skins for our VTT. It will if it makes the most money. I'm trying to think about, like, how did Magic the Gathering... I mean, did Matt... Oh, here, here's, a good, here's a good example. Did Magic the Gathering... Do you guys feel like Magic the Gathering has migrated more toward a, a digital environment? Or is it still really strong in the physical and what are the different man, I would love to is this guy somebody reach out to this guy. I wanna I wanna talk I wanna talk to this guy. Does he have a Discord? I wanna talk to this guy. Get him in here, chat. He doesn't have a Discord. I need to set up I'm gonna I wanna email this guy. I wanna set up a I wanna set up I wanna have a conversation. Tougher bad guys at you to compensate. Oh my gosh. My Dungeon masterpiece. I'm playing D and D. Send me a zoom to my email. I have literally three minutes. Oh, but oh man. Listen, let's set something up. Hey. Dang, he's only got three minutes. Uh, I'm in Discord. Ah, this sucks. I'm in Discord at the moment. I don't have Zoom. All right, I'll tell you what. Hey, no fun. Do me a favor. Call me and then call him. Call me and then call Dungeon. Dungeon Masterpiece. No fun's going to be our moderator. <laughs> no fun's going to moderate. This will be glorious. All right, let's put away, uh, let's put away our boy for a minute. Join now. Oh, here we go. Okay, I see it. All right, here we go. Hello. I'm here. Steely? Hey, What's Barry? up, buddy? I, I don't have a blazer on. I need to go get my blazer. <laughs> do what? No, I mean, do. Are we, so, are we live right now? Yes. Okay. All right, so listen, I just found your uh, your channel today. Like, it was uh, just recommended oh, really? to me. And I all I saw okay. was, your, was your 1 D&D take, which I feel like was a bit out there. But I do like your your presentation. But I want to I want to talk to you about your your take. Okay. All right. So first thing I want to ask you is uh, right at the beginning of the video, you said that Wizards is migrating more towards a a digital focus. Like that that's going to be the focus of of, of absolutely everything. All right. Tell me about that. Uh, so if you go and look at their past three. I mean, if you go and look at Hasbro's past three annual reports, one of the things that they keep harping on is how much money they're spending. And we're talking like multi-million dollar investment in digital assets. So the, obviously the bulk of that is Baldur's Gate 3, right? Okay. But they're also talking about migrating um, D&D Beyond into their own ecosystem, the investment into the VTT and integrating the uh, D&D Beyond experience into their new VTT. So when you have all of this money, I mean, a multi-million dollar project pays for a lot of development teams. Like $250,000 will pay for three months worth of development for a, a team of five, okay. right? So uh, when you have that much money going into these projects, I would imagine Baldur's Gate has probably got 50 to 75 developers on it. And I, w I work in IT, so I, I can just spitball numbers like this. I have a, a, a somewhat understanding of how much money and how much effort all this shit takes. Can I curse on your stream, by the yeah, way? Yeah, you're good. You're good. It's funny you said that. I'm, okay. IT, I'm IT, IT as well. It's great. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm a data engineer. Um, but uh, so... You know, when you see these kinds of numbers getting flubbed around and you see the kind of development work that's being done, you you just have a, a sixth sense, if you've been in the industry long enough, of, of what's actually happening here. Okay. And you, there is no way that you can justify to shareholders that you are a publishing company who predominantly prints books for print. Mm -hmm. and suddenly pivot to a multi-million dollar project 
in order to make all these digital, basically to create a digital footprint out of nothing. Like D and D basically had nothing until they purchased um, the D and D brand had nothing until it purchased D and D Beyond, right? As okay. far as a as far as a digital p- footprint, so you can't justify that behavior to shareholders unless your entire business model is going to be focused on that. And part of that strategy, as far as I can tell, if you look at Fortnite, if you look at Roblox, if you look at any game, Raid Shadow Legends, if you look at anything that has microtransactions in it, it's an extremely affordable way to entice players to get into uh, spending money on stuff that they otherwise wouldn't, right? Because like right now, only one-fifth of the entire Dungeons and Dragons community is spending money. And that's the dungeon master. Well, if you migrate this whole system to a virtual experience and you expose the players to microtransactions where they can buy avatars instead of miniatures, then, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the, the writing's on the wall for this. Like this, this is not a difficult decision to make. This is cakewalk that has been done with Roblox. It's been done with Mojang. It's been done with every with Raid Shadow Legends. Like this is this is minting money basically. So does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. I want to I want to kind of uh, unpack that a little bit. So the first so the okay. first one that I want to jump on is only the DM spends spends money on the on products. I feel like the players will invest pretty heavily. Maybe in different they, things. They will in a virtual space. You don't think you don't think players buy a lot of physical products? You think it's just you think they have like I have definitely been in a group where one person brings everything, but it's not always necessarily the DM. But you believe that that the DM provides all of the physical stuff and then the party just kind of flocks to that with their stacks, for example? I'm not I'm not saying that the DM buys all of it. I'm saying that and partially this is my anecdotal experience. Okay. Um but I mean, Might I as well. a lot of experience playing D and D. I have never seen a player have entire walls of bookshelves like people who are predominantly players. I've never seen a player have bookshelves of D and D or RPG books. I've okay. never seen that be a thing. I have multiple, multiple times over over fifty times people who play as dungeon masters, they have an entire wall of bookshelves uh, filled with D&D books. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I, I would love to see more hard data on that. That is an anecdotal yeah, experience. Yeah, my, mine's anecdotal as well. I ha- I know, so when I first started playing, um, there was one guy that was a player. He hated DMing, never DMed, but he was the one that brought the tub. He had like one of those big tubs full of 3.5 right. books. And he was the one that provided the books and then somebody else ran. But when it's definitely anecdotal, we would def- definitely need some evidence on that one. Um, I, I do agree that that they would have to invest more money because it's hard to pump money into a, a tabletop setting. Digital has so much more going for it. So I want to I see if we agree on this. Uh, Magic, Magic the Gathering is mostly uh, physical. That's where a majority of the fan base is. Magic the Gathering is mostly physical, but they do have a presence in digital with MTG Arena. Yes. Do you do you think, well, first, let's see. Uh, do you think that Wizards had to invest an equal amount of resources into Magic the Gathering Arena to get that going? No. As, as, it, as they did with uh, D&D Beyond? No. Oh, well... I, as they did with D and D Beyond or with you, the VTT. Do you think that there is a similar there is similarities between D and D Beyond Virtual Tabletop and MTG Arena, as far as resources put in? Okay, let, help help me understand exactly what you're saying. So, so are you asking me that are, when you say the VTT, we're like we're talking about the the pre alpha thing that is not released yet? Correct. Correct. Well, okay. uh, well, I'm talking about like the finish when they when they released the dungeons the the D and D Beyond virtual tabletop. I think that it's going to be similar to MTG Arena, and I don't necessarily believe that Wizards thinks that the MTG Arena or wants digital Magic the Gathering to take over. I think they would prefer physical, but I will acknowledge that physical has a more collector is is an investment, whereas D and D doesn't necessarily have that. You can sell Magic cards. You you can't really hoard uh, 
collectibles in the same way as Magic the Gathering. So do you think that it's a similar as far as investment and resources? As far as the development cost to create Magic the Gathering Arena? Right, because you mentioned like the amount of money they'd have to pour into it to make this right. work. And I'm in my mind, well, I'm, I'm compar comparing that to MTG Arena. So I would say that it doesn't. Doesn't. Uh, simply because effectively MTG Arena is, requires... The, a team of five developers and a few analysts or game writers could create MTG Arena. That is, that is a, a much smaller lift because all it effectively is is a rules engine that you put cards into that you already have the artwork for, right? And and the amount of the amount of actual coding that would need to go into that is quite minimal. Mm -hmm. Really, you just have to have a database of the cards and how they interact with each other. So that that requires some lift, but it's not the same kind of uh, like you don't have to worry about like a 3D physics engine. You don't have to worry about managing Unreal. You don't have to worry about uh, it, there, there's far more stuff that would go into the VTT to make that a models. reality. Right. Exactly. So uh, I I like, is there effort there? Yes, but it, I, I don't, I don't think it's, I, I think it would take five times as many developers to get the VTT up and running as right. it would be to, to keep the, to keep the Magic the Gathering arena. All right. My next question is, do you think okay. the amount of revenue that D and D beyond virtual tabletop brings in will match or, or pat surpass arena? That's interesting. Um, I would have to look at the size of the player base. I think on a per player, because uh, forgive me for not being too well versed on MTG. I haven't played in 20 years. I got yeah, out in Tempest yeah, Block. Um, but the, I think from a, a per player standpoint, I think it would be roughly the same. Because what a booster box costs, or a booster pack costs, what, $5 or something like that? Uh, a, an avatar for six months worth of play. Arena it, not has easy. Arena has a yeah. lot of those microtransactions that you mentioned. A lot about. Of those, it has like the right. cosmetics. You can have like a little pet next to your avatar. You can change your avatar right. to a famous character. There's a lot. There's like a lot of those microtransactions that we're all concerned right. about for the for the D and D Beyond Virtual Tabletop. And believe me, I know it's like, coming. I know it's coming. That kind of that kind of stuff is going to be there. And honestly, if if MTG is making that kind of money off of microtransactions now, MTG just set the benchmark. That's that's the goal to hit, right? Mm -hmm. Like D and D is going to be perceived as a failure by Hasbro, or the the VTT will be perceived as a failure by Hasbro if it can't match those numbers. So I think so. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I mean that on a per player basis. Like if you if if the VTT can't squeeze ten dollars uh, every three months, fifteen dollars every three months off of a player, it's it's not doing its job. They need better marketing within the app. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know which part of that I, I disagree with. Whether that's the amount Arena's bringing in, or whether or not that's the amount the and and that's a that's a hyperbolic figure. I'll 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 grant I'll grant you that. But uh, you know, I, I I don't I don't see creating a vehicle to to dish out microtransactions. Like even D and D Beyond right now, you can purchase a feat by itself for what three bucks, something like that, a buck ninety nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're mm -hmm. already yeah we're already getting there. I think We're it's going to be similar to Hero Forge, where you buy the miniatures and assets and all that stuff. Sure. Okay. Uh, so moving on. Okay. Yeah. So I think I think we pretty much. So, did you have any other questions? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I'm going to flip everybody around right now. By the way. Okay. Uh, can we can we flip the camera? Everybody, this is my D and D party. I'm currently playing D and D. We're taking a break, and I've got two players that are have COVID. That's why they're on a monitor in the back. So everybody's playing right now. Hey everybody. <laughs> but right. anyway, yeah, I got I got enough time for like one or two more questions. Okay, next question. All right, I'll try to keep them I'll try to keep them quick then. My next question is sure. you mentioned that with the focus on dungeons and or uh, on the D&D Beyond virtual tabletop that it would start taking away from player from custom like um third party soft or third, third party websites like Drive Through RPG, DM's Guild, that's going to start kind of sucking the life out of them when Wizards starts trying to make themselves the go-to place. And I'm and right. 
So I'm thinking that I think that those websites will expand by having by being able to develop resources for this new virtual tabletop. Perhaps they'll be able to build maps and sell them on DM Skilled or build maps and sell them on Drive Through RPG or sell like asset packs. Maybe if they have custom asset assets, things like that. Um, and you, you also said that they would take away from other tabletop RPGs. And I think yes. that if D and D was removed from those websites, that other TTRPGs would actually have some breathing room and may actually grow. But it's also possible that the sites would just die outright. So I want to kind of I want to expand on that. So what are your thoughts on those on those two? Okay. Points? So here's the thing: they've already purchased D and D Beyond, right? Mm -hmm. So they've already purchased a a back end software system for handling oh. online transactions. So it only makes sense to me if you're going to be dealing with micro if you're already buying digital assets for characters, why would you not also be rolling your event tree programs of your adventures into that system as well? So if you're handling everything natively within your own VTT, why do you need one bookshelf? And if anything, they may just purchase that section of one bookshelf out from underneath them and say, hey, you're going to give me DMs Guild and here's the check. And they're going to integrate that into the VTT experience. So once they do that, real quick, all of, the, all of the marketing that goes to into Dungeons and Dragons, because remember, they're owned by Hasbro. So if you go to Hasbro headquarters, they've got like mock up stores of what their stuff looks like in a grocery store, in a Walmart, in a bookstore, Barnes and Noble, whatever. They've got mock-ups of all of this stuff so they can see what their product looks like lined up against competitors. Just the fact that they have contracts with all these big box stores, that they can just stick their products there. Like D&D is now selling self-help books, for crying out loud. You know? <laughs> Cookbooks. So, uh, and that's not a joke. Like, go Google it, D&D self-help book. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but they missed a they missed a, a golden opportunity to name it like you know critical success or something like that. Uh, at any oh rate, uh, you know when you have that much marketing potential with Hasbro, why would you even afford any opportunity for any kind of competitor to enter the scene? Because the last thing you want to have happen is the uh, fourth edition fiasco that because they didn't have that market dominance allowed Pathfinder to come on the scene. Why would you, why would you even create an ecosystem where that is a possibility again? I think they would do more harm than good to themselves in the, in an attempt to isolate themselves that way. But, but we, we may, we may have to agree to disagree on that one. What I'm concerned with is, um, Play, so people that want to create their own adventures, like in the DM skill, people that write their own adventures and sell them on the DM skill, you believe that that's going to go away? Like that's not even. So the people writing their own adventures is obviously not going to stop. What I think is going to happen, because if like I put up a poll on my website and I was actually kind of shocked at the numbers. Um, roughly a third of Dungeons and Dragons players now play on virtual tabletop. Mm -hmm. So if if you are a game writer and you're trying to write content, not content that you want to just write, but that you want to have visibility. And the VTT market is expanding and you see that mm -hmm. as a writer, I'm not going to write a, an adventure as a PDF. I'm going to write it inside the VTT ecosystem, whatever that looks like, if that's programming events, if that's. Uh, doing some voice acting for NPCs that players can click on, you know, like how far involved are we going to go here? You know, and some of this is future casting a little sure. bit, sure. But um, I don't see a, I don't see a platform where you can sell a PDF surviving when VTT has been expanding so much. And you can just create all the maps. You can create all the assets. Maybe even add in a little bit of voice acting for like hover over stuff for PCs that are messing around in, in the game. Sure. Uh, I, lo I love Whatever that. it is. There, it, you know, all this kind of whiz bang stuff is stuff 10 year olds are going to love. You know, mm -hmm. the extremely young Gen Z, they're going to love this stuff. So 
why would you create a PDF when you're going to get the most visibility by programming an adventure in the VTT ecosystem? Does that make sense? Yes. And so, if you're doing if you're doing that, then that content is never going to show up as a PDF because it's just not the juice isn't worth the squeeze to put on a, a site like DMs Guild if it survives. Okay. So I think we have an example of that already with Roll20. When Roll20 started to grow, it provided a virtual tabletop. And the DMs Guild and Drive-Thru RPG adapted by providing resources for Roll20 specifically. So you can go to Drive-Thru RPG and you can get Fantasy Grounds material. You can get Roll20 material. I believe that those websites are going to adapt to the environment with the um, virtual tabletop for D&D Beyond and start selling maybe the voice lines that you recommended or or, sure. the, or that and you the, mentioned or the 3D maps. That possibility hinges on Wizards of the Coast having an open API for them to be able to submit that material to Roll20 because Roll20 opened an API for that purpose because they knew people were hungry for it. Does that make sense? So yes. if, if the VTT has an open API, open API, then that will happen. Sure. I, I agree with that 100%. But the question is, is, is it worth it for Wizards of the Coast to spend time creating a public API so that they can work with competitors? Maybe. I don't see it happening, though. I honestly see this as a power play to lock down on the fact that the open game license exists. That is interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm in the complete opposite camp. I believe that the the uh, open game the OGL is going to expand from this. I do not think it's going to get more restrictive. I honestly think if if they make it more restrictive, they're going to push players into the arms of other of other um, game systems if they if they do that. But I mean that that may be tinfoil hat. I think we're both in, in both. Yeah, like, I, really. I agree with you. For seasoned gamers, I absolutely agree with you. And and I think that's that's something that. You know, I kept saying the word generation and even having those silly jump cuts in, yeah, my, yeah, in my video. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's, that's something that people aren't quite clicking with yet, is that you and I, if we get pissed off, we're just going to go play another RPG. I'll go play Mothership or Traveler and never think about it ever again. Yeah. What I'm concerned about are the 10-year-olds who have no idea and no ability to even understand that other RPGs even exist. That would that would be interesting. Um, that that's my that was the thesis statement of my video is that the next generation is going to have the problem. It's not us. Like yeah, we can <laughs> we got this. We can just turn it off and 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 be done with the problem. Fine, we'll go play some other RPG. It's the ten year olds who have who don't even know the right things to Google to go find another RPG. All right. Yeah, so uh, so it's up to the so will will Wizards of the Coast allow third party and will the younger generation br- branch out if they do? That's really what it comes down to. I look forward yep. to finding out. Don't let me uh, hold up your D and D game any longer. It was fun. Okay, thank fun. you, you, were, you and were... thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it, and thank you to my players. I, I think uh, I'm going to spin the camera around one more time. So everybody in the chat, say thank you to my players for allowing me to jump on this call real fast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your yeah, time. Thanks for having me, Steely. Later, y'all. Well, that was fun. Um, <laughs> so he seems like a really cool guy. I like him. He's a bit insane. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. Um, I don't agree. I still don't agree with him. Uh, but I definitely see where he's coming from. That was Dungeon Masterpiece, by the way. Dungeon Masterpiece. What a fun, what a fun chat that was. What a fun chat. Go check out Dungeon Masterpiece. Go give him a sub. Be nice. He was so respectful. I want you all to do the same. Yeah, he was very fun. He was very fun to talk to. So what do you guys think? I'm gonna pass it off to you. What did you guys think of that uh, that debate? I think that was a. Uh, I don't know any other books. I'll be honest. What did you guys think of that debate? He's like that kind of insane genius. Yeah, I think he's a bit out there, but uh, 
There may be a nugget. There may be a nugget of truth to it. He has great videos on geo geopolitics for D&D. You never debate me. Feels better. Dude, we debate all the time. We just haven't debated on... Uh, we just haven't debated on stream yet. 